Hi, this is Kim White with the My Sexy Business team, and I'm here with my beautiful co-host again, Christy Bridges from One Moment Wiser. Hi. We are at the Hope to Hope conference, and we are thrilled to tell you this has been an amazing conference already, and this is only the second day of four. I know. It's we so, get more. I'm so excited. It's very <laughs> exciting, and we have someone very special coming on with us that bless her heart, we kind of roped her in at the last minute. <laughs> so we have already been having fun behind the scenes. I'm really probably glad that we weren't already live because we might have been in trouble. <laughs> we were having a good time. We, we have um, the famous Dr. Robin Donaldson with us. She's a clinical psychologist and she has a, a program that's grief yoga. And she has all kinds of stuff going that she's going to talk about. Um, she suffered loss, as like as a lot of us have, and we are going to talk a little bit of that about that too. But welcome, Dr. Robin. Hello. Thank you so very very much. I am thrilled to be here, even if you roped me in. No worries. <laughs> we got our lasso out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you are. Where are you at? Are you in Las Vegas? I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. Yes, ma'am. I couldn't remember. I just like went blank. See, there's that memory <laughs> thing again. <laughs> Password, and I couldn't remember the location. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what, like, I just want to get right into it because I'm so curious about the thing. I know that you suffered a loss, and I would love if you wouldn't mind sharing that with our audience of, you know, what, what your experience was and what has gone on in your life. Sure. So four and a half years ago, my husband was killed in a motorcycle accident uh, mm. less than a mile from our house on his way home from work. Um, I found out because he wasn't texting me back as was our normal to figure out what we're going to do for dinner and how things, you know, kind of what the rest of the evening was going to look like. And then when I came home and the lights were off, I knew something was amiss. So I went searching for him and I saw that close to the house, the street was roped off um, with, with police tape and you couldn't get on there. So I went and I uh, stopped over at my mom's who was very close and I said, would you, you know, we, we had been calling the hospitals, the uh, jail as, as you do um, when you're not sure what may have happened to your loved one. Um, and then I asked her to come with me to go check it out, and that's that's where we found him. Oh, um, I'm, sorry. I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you very, very much. Um, it was definitely a shock. Um, a lot of the, the emotions of, of going through such a traumatic, immediate um, loss like that. Uh, you know, I did the best that, that I could. I had a lot of support from um, family and friends. Uh, we were talking technology. So my husband had, you know, all the passwords to very important accounts. And so right after he passed away and as we were planning for the funeral, I had a bunch of um, our techie friends trying to just hack into all of our accounts and they did it. And it was brilliant. I'm like, this is great and kind of concerning, but mostly <laughs> great. They also, some of them knew what some of his passwords were or uh, could figure it out from conversations and just knowledge. But anyway, um, so over the, the next couple of years, I was just trying to, to get my life together, figure out where I wanted to go from there. I ended up working practically three jobs um, out of uh, concern that I wasn't going to be able to afford the house that we had just bought. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of settled down to work to, for the university. Um, and then I realized that after about three years of just going full steam ahead that perhaps I was a bit burnt out. Mm -hmm. um, the good part of that and what is what, is what I'm feeling, feeling my passion now is that um, about two years into to my widowhood, I was on vacation uh, with a girlfriend of mine, and we were talking about the holidays, and that holiday, because um, that's one thing I learned from lots, um, order off everything off of Amazon or some type of online store so that you don't have to go shopping. You can just stay at home and order everything, and you are set. So that year, we, um, I had ordered a bunch of boxes for my family, and 
I said, you know, they need a box subscription box company for grief. We we're laughing. Oh, isn't that funny? Um, and then on that trip, we found out that her father had passed away. Oh gosh. And that really just felt to me of, you know, absolutely. I'll take it as a sign. It's definitely something that needs to, to happen. Um, so I started brainstorming and, you know, we, we started putting business plans together. And then uh, once I sold my house, I you know, was able to then financially say, OK, I'm going to take a break and really focus on Saul's Club. And so now that is a company that provides care packages for people in grief. That is our, our main retail. Um, however, our underlying mission is that we, we want to change how people help support other people in grief. Well, you know that this conference came from the loss of my son. <clears throat> That's actually what started the process. Mm. And I can tell you, one of the most uncomfortable things for most people when they saw me after that is they didn't know what to say or do for me. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be sweet and they wanted to say something, you know, that in one sentence would cure all my pain. Yes. And that's not possible. No. And the thought of having something come, you know, especially more than once, you know, being able to, go through um, like what you're talking about, a, a package of something, it kind of takes the awkward out of it. To, to me, a lot of people feel very awkward when they come to you after you've lost someone. People have no idea. And I don't, we can speculate all day of, of how things have changed in society and, and what may have contributed to that. But most of what I, I hear from folks uh, wanting to reach out to people in grief is that they don't know. And so part of what I want to do is, okay, if this is an educational issue, let's go educate. So on our website, we have, I, I blog about giving people hints and tips. And um, I started uh, this thing called Solace Show, um, which is another way to, to communicate. It's a live uh, broadcast, somewhat similar to uh, what we are doing here do it monthly and talk about those tough topics. You know, how do you support people? What are different ways that people can get some support um, in their local communities and whatnot? Because you're right, they, people wanna help, um, but oftentimes they're at a loss uh, for words or what they say ends up landing a little flat or, you know, may not feel as supportive as it could be. Well, you know, sometimes when you're grieving, you're a little volatile, right? Yeah. When, we're, when we're in pain, we go back to our, uh, you know, some kind of an animal nature sometimes where, where we're reactionary, um, not necessarily based on what somebody else is doing or saying, but based on the pain we're feeling. Yeah. And so when you have someone who already feels a little incompetent and doesn't know how to be present for someone who's grieving, and then you have the, the normal reaction of someone who's grieving and isn't quite in control of their responses. It really helps to have um, a conversation going, like you said, on your monthly pocket, yeah, your monthly shows where people can actually kind of hear how to interact during those times, how to communicate, what really does help. Absolutely. I've learned the hard way. Like, you know, I wasn't prepared I wasn't prepared to lose a child. No. And it was and it was a hunting accident, so it was instant. You know, it wasn't a it wasn't even anything I could think about maybe coming down the pike, you know, that he was sick or something. It was I went to the store to get movies and popcorn because we were gonna have movie night and I come back and he's gone. <clears throat> and so it was very, it's, and, and I think you probably were never prepared right. at your young age to have to deal with the loss of a husband. I mean, those are not normal time frames right. for dealing with the loss. So I think that makes it a little more complicated. Yeah. It, it makes it more complicated for people to be good to you because they can't, and they can't, this is the thing I guess I want everybody to know, is they can't say anything that's going to take the pain away. Right. They can't. Right. 
Believe me, if they could, they would have come up with it now and they'd be selling it somewhere and that we could all buy it or hear it or, or something like that. And, yeah. and, you know, and I am also extremely sorry to hear about your loss as well. Okay. Which I say um, from, from my heart, knowing that there are some folks in grief that may not like the fact that I might say that I am sorry. I found that offering up condolences helps. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in grief similar to, to you, I don't know your experience, but I went into shock. Yes. And so, you know, sure, emotional volatility came late, later or um, being just, just having a, a whole plethora of emotions. Um, but when people would say things that would be a little off to me, it was easy for me to, to not really feel it because I was so so much in shock and kind of numb. And I tried to recognize that they were trying to help. And I was able to hear that. But I also know that not everybody is going to have my experience or to be able to say, you know, this, this is just somebody that doesn't know my religious background or somebody that um, is trying to make me feel better, but oh gosh, I'm not ready to date yet. or you know, whatever the circumstance might be. And that really led me to, to want to, to encourage folks to have other options of how to support people. As a psychologist, you understand, and I don't know that we said that uh, Robin is a doctor, Robin Donaldson, a clinical psychologist. So as a psychologist, you understand, I think maybe people's motivations and have a little extra compassion in that realm. And I'd, like, like, to think so. I'd like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> and then that there's a process. Yes. Like that's one of the things that I sound like a broken record and I'm okay with that <laughs> when it comes to that because I feel like everyone needs to know that has lost someone that it's okay however you have to, to cope with it. Like it's okay to grieve in your way. You don't have to grieve like your spouse, you don't have to grieve like your children or your friend or, you know, the neighbor down the street that just experienced something similar. Whatever you have to do in you to, to cope with that, that's an okay thing. Don't pass judgment on someone, you know, don't, don't say, well, you should this or you should that by you know, not allowing them the freedom, I guess, not allowing them the freedom. And I do know there's a process and, and you can be walked through that because I do think people get stuck, mm -hmm. you know, but I do think that that's one of the really, um, really important things that I did some kind of weird things compared to what other people would have done maybe when my son passed away. Okay. But it actually caused me to you know, be able to move forward. It actually caused me to be able to, and I'm not talking like freaky things, but there was just some, well, like for an example, I wanted to dress him for the funeral, like for the, and that's not something, as a matter of fact, the funeral home was like panicking because they've never had anybody do that. Mm -hmm. But that was my, that was my baby. And I told them, you know, I dressed him the first time I wanted to dress him the last time. And so they helped me. I mean, it wasn't, you know, but that's a, that's not a normal thing, but I can't tell you the, the comfort I got in that. There was something very healing in that. That just breaks my heart. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> She's sorry. She must have me for making her cry today. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, <laughs> okay. Plenty of tissues. you got plenty of tissues over oh, there. You gotcha. Well, and, and the thing is, you guys are talking about, healthy you know unusual yeah but somewhat healthy things you didn't turn to something that was going to lock up your life and, mm -hmm. and suck you into it some addiction that that would numb you but not right. keep you experiencing the pain you went forward with hurting but doing things that expressed your your pain expressed the emotion and the love that you were feeling and you were so afraid to feel and it's not it's not to be feared it's to be experienced because if we don't just experience it we can't move forward we end up trapped in a 
at a place where we we can't get any higher. Absolutely. I um I I want to come to that emotional piece here in a second. Um, but I I would like to, to offer a counter to the normal behaviors after grief. Mm -hmm. You could posit that how we deal with death and preparing for a funeral now is abnormal. I mean, we used to put a body of our loved one on the dining room table until the funeral. And then we, the family would bathe the body, the family would dress the body. So when you say it's not normal, I'm thinking it's actually a lot more normal than you would think. It's not considered to be part of what things are done now because it's so sterile, very clinical now. Um, and I think that that, you know, I told you I could go on and on about some of the mm -hmm. ideas of why and how we've come to this, but, but that's part of how we re are removed from death and from, from the, that very stark reality of what happens to us after we die. So I love the fact that you got to dress your son for the last time. Like that makes my heart feel like, like it swells. It just, I'm like, oh, I'm so glad. I'm so thankful for that. And I think that when it comes to the emotions, um, I think that we, we shy away as a society away from negative emotions in general mm -hmm. and grief that's that's pretty much that's a good umbrella for all negative emotions what we consider negative under there and so people they would like to avoid that they would like to avoid perhaps um bringing that up in the person that is grieving um and i i don't think that that's necessarily healthy but i do believe it's it's like a defense mechanism for for other people because they're not sure how to deal with that or how to deal with another person experiencing those hard emotions. It is scary to, you don't want to lose this person forever in grief or see them follow after the person they've lost. And, and so just as a reactionary effort, you're like, Oh, well, let me cheer you up, you know? And, and when we see someone smile, we think, Oh, what I'm doing is working. And that's a reward in itself, a small reward. Uh, we feel like we're helping, but um, we don't necessarily, I mean, I think that's a great reward. I love Kim's smile. But we don't necessarily have to just pursue that as, oh, I'm, I'm doing a good job being a friend. We can sit and just experience the moment with them. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to be, we need to be, feel safe doing that. And tell us about, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say, and as someone who's lost someone, it's almost like a demand being put on us, though, <clears throat> in the very beginning. Now, I'm not talking about years down the road. I'm talking in the first few days, especially mm -hmm. when someone's trying to, to cheer you up. You almost feel obligated to put on a smile for them. It's exhausting. But that's exhausting mm -hmm. because, you know, during the first little bit in particular, I think being able to get that out, being able to address the the pain parts are important. I mean, I, I don't know, like, I don't know how you came through yours um, specifically. And I think, again, everybody is a little different, but it was very important for me because I had other children to live up to a certain thing, to make sure that they knew everything was going to be okay. But then I would go privately and just completely fall apart. You know, I didn't, I was mad. I don't, since you didn't watch any of the, like the other conference parts yet, when the next morning when the sun rose, I was mad at God. I couldn't believe he allowed the sun to rise because my world was over. You know, that's the way I felt that morning. And I can remember, you know, thinking that this all has to be something that has to be addressed you know I was like fired up because it's like you know how can you how can you let the sun rise and that's all part of like that's all part of the process but then I also had to turn around and be a good mama to my boys that were still living because I still had a responsibility so there is an exhausting part to to grieving that that 
um, I would love to hear your like input on that part because that is a that is a part of the process that I don't hear anyone really talking about. Yeah. And it is exhausting. Which in particular, because I'm I'm picking up on the the challenges of being a parent, dealing with grieving children in addition to your own grief, which is exhausting and extremely challenging to balance. Well, uh, being able to to keep the I guess you would say more scary reactions um, and finding healthy outlets versus showing your your children that are also grieving because uh, they're looking to you to model how to grieve. And if you hide all of that, then they don't learn how it's okay to grieve. And so they will uh, restrict and suppress their emotions. So, oh yeah, it is it is such a delicate balance and um, you're always feeling like you're, you're messing up on in some regard, if you're emoting too much or not enough. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just that right there is exhausting work. Yes. So I hear that. And those are my thoughts on that of like, you do the best that you can. And yes, showing your kids that you are upset is okay. And making sure that you have adult support so that you're not just leaning on your, the children that are also grieving is very important too. Yes. And I have a feeling that you, you did a combination there. Well, we had about 2000 people come to our house, like yeah. literally. And it was keeping my, it was keeping me stirred up, but it also was keeping my children stirred up. And this is like in a three day period. Mm -hmm. And so I actually had my boys go and stay with my aunt and uncle mm -hmm. who were far enough away that they were not, um, they were allowed some time. They were allowed some freedom to, to be okay without everybody being in their face. Yeah. And I actually think that was a, one of the wisest decisions I made at the time because it kept them from, you know, being just bombarded because like I said, people want to say awesome things to you. Mm -hmm. The awesome things they say to you a lot of times are not awesome things. <laughs> they just don't know it at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like switching from this though, into the, the fact that you have created something they give someone the ability to minister to someone. Like explain more about that because I think it's a really, it's a really awesome um, gift that came out of such a, a devastating loss. Absolutely. So, so my first thought as I, okay, maybe not my exact first thought um, <laughs> but in thinking about how to go about Saul's club, is that I keep remembering sitting in my living room, surrounded by vases, vases, however you want to pronounce them, like, oh my gosh, dozens and dozens all around me of these flowers that are dying. They're dead. They're cut from the, the earth. They are in the process of wilting away. And somebody was going to have to go through and take out the dead ones, refill the water. And I didn't have the energy to do that. And when we send somebody flowers, we don't think about that, especially in a funeral of, you know, is there going to be somebody that's going to take care of that? And um, is that really what we want to be putting on the person? Mm -hmm. And so recognizing, yeah, flowers are not enough. I, you know, they're very nice and it's great for the, the funeral, I'm sure, to, to show that the person was loved. But again, I still think that there are better ways that we can do it. So then I started thinking, okay, what is it that I need or needed when I was going through, especially those initial stages of grief? And I thought about how much my appetite was impacted. Um, some people get very nauseous. I didn't get nauseous, but I definitely was. I lost 20 pounds in the first two weeks, which, yeah, that was, and, and I've never, mm -hmm, how to put this, I've always had a love of food. <laughs> you just loved me. Um, but then my body started not liking the sugar. Yeah. Anyway, I've worked at maintaining my weight throughout my, my life. But when I came to be stricken with grief, I couldn't keep weight on. And that was a, that was, that was new. 
Um, but I digress. And so uh, ginger drops, that was, you know, something that I thought, okay, that could help with, with people's nausea, um, rescue remedy, the, the herbal um, de-stressor that's not habit-forming, um, a journal. So different things that somebody could hold in their hands and actually use when they are grieving. Okay, so that was, that was a big thing. And that's just a couple of examples from one box. I wanted there to be multiple boxes to address many different pieces of grieving. So we have like an anger box to say, hey, guess what? You're gonna be angry and that's okay. Here's some healthy ideas of how to, to get it out. Um, because in offering multiple boxes, the idea is not that right around the funeral, everybody comes around and gathers those 2000 people. I bet you like three months later, they were not to be found at your doorstep. No, they disappear, they go back to their everyday lives. Yeah. But sending a box, sending a care package allows people to know and allows the person grieving to know that people still care and it gives permission for the person grieving to take care of themselves and gives them suggestions of how they can do it. I have to tell you that is one of the um, biggest things that I learned through that whole process. And I'm talking about when I came all the way you know, to the other side of the, the major grieving, because at the time I couldn't have told you anything. <laughs> but when when you come to the other side of it, you do realize that those times when um, I didn't hear his, his footsteps anymore, like that was a devastating thing. And it took me a little bit to to get to that point. Those people that were so awesome, and I'm telling you, they were amazing to me they were back to their lives and and i'm not going back to my life like i'm i'm still in that place of we're trying to figure out what life looks like now because life now has not got the same look that it did before and just in the time that he's been gone which is going to be 17 years this year i cannot tell you how many families i've gone to that have lost a child in particular and talk to like their families and things and told them like kind of a time frame. Y you need to check on them at this point. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, everybody's here now and it's awesome, but they don't know it. Like they don't really, if you've got 50 people surrounding you and you're trying to grieve, you actually don't have understanding of how many people are there because you're in this right. place. But a month from now, where are they? And two months from now, like we need that. We need that supportive. And I'm sorry, I say all of this to say that one of the ladies that knew my son, she was at his school. She took a little, um, it was a Winnie the Pooh. She took a little Winnie the Pooh and put it out on his um, grave and, and told me she had done it. That meant so much to me because it was it was after the fact. All the hoopla, so to speak, was gone. And she did it after the fact because she still remembered. That meant so much to me because she was she was still willing to be in that space with me. Right. You know, she was still willing. And so I, I can't even imagine getting a box how impactful that would be to get something, you know, that everybody's gone, it's quiet. Now you have to now you have to deal with it. Something that tells you instead of hurry up and get over your grief, hey, you're still feeling something and I know you're gonna be feeling something. So here, I'm just letting you know it's okay. And by the way, there are ways you can take care of yourself. So I'm giving you those ways. What a beautiful concept. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm in awe. I love that idea. Like you're super fun. I'm going to point that out. You're super <laughs> yeah. fun. We've been having fun before we came on, but I mean, we got real serious real quick. You know, this is Not serious. A feel. But the, the fact that you took that experience and you create like, I mean, I just can't imagine how many lives you've impacted. Well, and you know, back to the not being afraid to feel when you feel, you can think 
right? When you're done feeling, you can think, and then all of a sudden you're helping other people. Robin, I, uh, Dr. Robin, I love that you've, you've taken your own pain and gone, I'm going to touch other people's lives with this. That's just beautiful. Thank you very much. And it's it's part of, of how I, I feel like my individual role is in life in general. You know, I mm -hmm. decided to become a psychologist for a reason, and that was to, to help people with tough things. And, you know, it took some time you know, for me to figure out my, my own life and my own direction and, and to see that there there was this this need, this this place where, you know, I could put together some ideas and I had the energy and, and it, it, it wanes. You know, one of the things that I was going to, my energy wanes, I was going to say is that, you know, you were to grieve the loss of your son for the rest of your life. I'm going to grieve the loss of my husband for the rest of my life. The, the grief, yes, there is that initial phase, that very, very scary phase. However, oh my goodness, there it's still, it, you know, it, it comes back and there are moments. And when, when I have other losses, there's like the compounding loss. So learning how to, to deal with grief effectively, nobody teaches you that in kindergarten. We typically will look to our adults in our lives and, super awesome at it um, typically unless oh I don't know they've done a lot of their own work um, just because we, we don't like the hard emotions and so it's it's something that if, if we can really focus on on helping each other that's that's where I really feel like yes the boxes are great and all of this piece but I assume that every person that I interact with on any any basis is dealing with some form of grief and I think that if we kind of change our mindset to that, we'll be able to be better grief supporters to other people as well as to ourselves. So, so yes, the box is great, and it's so much more than the box. Yes. Yeah. Well, okay, tell us how to get them first off, because I don't want to get off of here and, and like, not have that down, because I'm telling you, I, I, I'm sold. I don't know. <laughs> We're not, this is not a selling conference. I'm going to repeat that. Everybody like, I don't want anybody to get freaky. This is not a selling conference. I need this information so that I can be buying. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, go up there on, and check out my blogs. See what I have to say. I have a um, Dr. Donaldson's journal on there where I talk about my own experiences. I, I'm working on one right now because I'm in the process of moving, which is very, very tough. Um, even though it's, you know, four and a half years, but guess what? Packing up stuff brings up so many really tough emotions. Yeah. Um, so the, our website is www.solaceclub, S-O-L-A-C-E-C-L-U-B.com. All right. And I also put your Facebook page on there. Thanks. So we've got both, if you guys are looking at the comments, and please comment. If this is touching you, comment. If you know someone it's good touch, share it. So, yeah. Now, you mentioned that you were working at a university. A clinical psychologist, you do research, right? You were working at a university, and you stepped away from that. Um, be, what was that transition like? What what inspired you to, to move on? And, and what it, was that the Solace Club that, that was your transition just to clarify i was uh doing therapy with the students i was not oh. doing the research i did plenty of that for my dissertation to get my phd but mm -hmm. i opted not to follow the um, traditional professor route just because it can get a little confusing um, i want to give credit to those that do that type of work and recognize that may not be for me in the foreseeable future uh, but Regardless, I stepped away from a very, um, very stable position, right? Because working for yourself is is always, you know, a little stressful in and of itself. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's hard to offer myself the same package deal that I got at the university, mm -hmm. and it was scary. And it felt so important that if it, when you when you lose somebody, you really start to reassess your life and the people in it and what you're doing every single day because I could die the next day. I remember going into work and, you know, people would be very stressed. We had, unfortunately, a lot of 
uh, the mental health of college students this day and age, it's, it's really troubling. And so there, it was a very stressful work environment. And we were understaffed and all of that really, really challenging piece. But I would say to whatever decision or whatever situation, I would say, you know, who's going to live or die on this? Nobody? Guess what? We have time. We can deal with that later. Uh, and then sometimes it was a matter of life or death. And so then that would take the higher precedent. Um, so being able to, to step away from that piece, to focus on something where I knew that I could help a lot of people, that was what really motivated me. I mean, sure, it was scary. It was, it was a change. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to just spend the rest of my life kind of wondering and just kind of noticing that, oh, this, we need to be better about this. You know, what could I do to actively change that? That's awesome. So you and, and you found purpose mm -hmm. at a time when you needed that purpose and you had that awareness that I need to be doing something that not everybody else is doing right now, something that can really make an impact. Absolutely. You, uh, when we were talking before, you mentioned that like every smart entrepreneur, you actually have multiple things that you do, right? Tell us about grief yoga. What started that? I, I would love to think that this is this is the smart piece as opposed oh. to, you know, ooh, shiny, pretty. Oh, let me try this. And it's not that I recognize, but sometimes I'm like, this is just, I, I've never really thought of myself of an, as an entrepreneur until this. So this has been an amusing journey, we'll put it that way. Um, while I was uh, grieving and the really tough parts, I had a psychologist colleague of mine who was starting to really get into yoga and um, she is now a yoga instructor and psychologist. And she would say to me, you know, come on, Robin, let's, let's go to a yoga class. And I would oftentimes say no. And she kept asking me. Um, and so I would eventually say yes. And it would get me out of the house. Um, I didn't really have to interact with people. Mm -hmm. And it was hard so that I was physically moving and doing something that put me to the point where I had a physical release. I can't tell you the number of times that I was crying on my mat. Um, and nobody cared because they were all focused on what they were doing and a lot of sweat, right? Is it sweat? Is it tears? Who knows? Who cares? Mm -hmm. um, and so knowing how impactful yoga had been for me, I was like, you know, there's something to this. But it wasn't until I went to the Association for um, Deaf Educators and Counselors last year about this time, um, and they, they had uh, two people talking about it. Um, one person was actually doing it, and you could uh, experience it if you wanted to get up at 7.30 in the morning, which I did once. <laughs> um, and it was a good experience. And, uh, and then learning about this, and it just it really made sense to me. And so when I came back home, I did a little research. You know, there were a couple of books, but nobody is actively uh, pushing that. Most of the, the yoga studios are all about physical fitness or um, uh, one thing that has come up, unfortunately, with our society, we've had a lot of trauma. Um, and so I, I just got certified in the trauma recovery yoga that is here. And I feel like it is a beautiful um, uh, complementary overlap between trauma and grief because as I say when, when you lose a loved one that is traumatic that is a trauma which at the time I did not recognize it took me oh my gosh maybe just the past six months or a year for me to recognize yeah that was a trauma mm -hmm. I was traumatized by my husband dying and all the physiological things that happen it's not just oh this is an emotional state it's like no like my, my body is not quite right even to this day from what happened and I need to adjust because of that mm -hmm. and it's and it's not oh if I'm just you know strong-willed enough I can I can master this no I need to be doing something physically along with everything else yeah. and so knowing that mind-body connection with grief yoga is a mind-body connection application um, that works extremely well I think in helping people uh, manage their emotional reactions in life in general, and particularly in grief. Awesome. I would have loved to have had something like that. 
great. Yeah. I, and that's why it needs to get out there. We need to be promoting it and to encouraging studios. Hey, this is a thing. More and more research uh, <coughs> showing the, the efficacy of yoga programs on things like PTSD, anxiety, depression, um, and slowly getting to, to grief. And so when there's more evidence, more people are going to recognize that, yeah, this is, this is a tool that you have to help with your grief. That's my we hope. feel so low energy when we're depressed. Yes. And it, it's so hard to move and because you, you just you don't want to. And, and everything feels heavy. But there is a definite um, healing when we combine our, our actual psychological therapy with our physical movement. Like you said, it, it made you sweat. It was hard. You had to focus on it. Um, you had to try. And, it, and because of that, the physical release came. I, yeah, I totally see. But it's not now. high energy. No, I think that's the other part that's pretty amazing about like the yoga um, and the thought of doing it like when you're going through that mm -hmm. is that you're not expending the energy in a wrong way. You're like, not expected to bounce around to, and look happy. <laughs> to go bouncing it at a class, I would have had a really hard time, you know, to have done that. But I would have, I would have definitely benefited from something like that where I could have taken some of the physical um, turmoil really the you know the physical that 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 you have going on I, I'm glad you touched on that because a lot of people don't realize um, they just don't allow themselves to to feel the things that are going on and we do have physical things in our bodies that you know and I'm not the doctor you're the doctor. <laughs> I'm just I'm the princess. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. I have to put that out there. But you have way more education than I ever will. So <laughs> we, you know, but we we do experience things physically. Um, I know that in the first, I think it was the first 36 hours, I, oh my goodness, my entire body was affected. Sure. And. It didn't just stop. I mean, it lessened a little, of course, but it didn't just stop at that point. I can remember being absolutely physically jolted. And the thought of having someone be able to walk me through a grief yoga. You know, I mean, I think that in particular, because that's that's the thing I know, is to be able to have someone allow me the privacy of my own mat. <laughs> and if, if I'm crying, just let me but yet take me through some physical things so that I don't get, um, I don't really know what the right word is, but you can get Bound up. stiff. Yeah. You know, you can get, um, because you are tense. That, that's another thing I think about. You're so tense after something like that because of the trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You, you're onto something, Dr. Robin. I agree. I, I really would love to see, and I know we're probably not at that stage yet, but I would love to see, you know, insurance companies and, and providers understand more about the benefit of, of not just talking to someone. We do need to talk. We need to open up about what we feel and talk things out with someone in order to think properly sometimes. But I, I'd like to see more of this, more of the combination uh, where you're using your body not just rehashing um, things for an extended period of time. I, it's, oh, there's just, that gets me excited because there's so, we can get unstuck yeah. more easily if we uh, use our emotion. If we, if, we, if we use our physical selves, then we, we regain a sense of power over our lives. We in to start we start moving because we want to deal with the grief but then we keep moving and and life becomes about the living absolutely absolutely and i think this that is supposed to be an interview and we just can't let you talk I mean, we need to be quiet we, we just keep getting so excited about what you're saying i'm so sorry well connie said she was going to inspire us she, no worries it's a friend of 
and Connie Myers, you guys, and boy, that woman knows some quality people. <laughs> Um, well, and it's and it's great because what you have to say is also very full of quality. Like it's 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 extremely helpful for for listeners to to receive that. And, and you know, I I echo all of your sentiments. Um, I think that as it pertains to the insurances, I think that we're getting there. Um, they're recognizing the importance of uh, preventative, and something like a grief for yoga could be something that they could offer to everybody after a loss um, with the idea that it may decrease the uh, number of antidepressants that may need to be prescribed and or you know um, length of psychotherapy that that needs to be in. And I, I, I like that idea it's just like you said we are not there yet but I think that we are closer if we just continue to, to keep motivating and, um, and encouraging that. I also wanted to, to put in, um, plug a future idea of mine um, as part of this Yoga for Grief, uh, in addition to doing uh, live classes in town or, or wherever, it is my, my hope and my plan to create uh, things that you can watch online because there's still a step of leaving the house when you're in grief. There's a step of, oh my gosh, I have to get dressed for this. Can't I just do this in my pajamas? So giving folks a chance that when they're at the, the stage where they're not ready to go out or to be among people, that they can still move their body while at home. So I want that as like the first step. Well, I have to tell you, I, I probably shouldn't say too much, but um, Carl Deckler is the CEO of Beachbody. Okay. They have an on-demand um, <coughs> thing where you can pick out the exercise that you do for so much a month. Nice. I'm thinking how amazing would it be to have that available? Because here's the thing that I also know during that process, if it's not already available or you don't already know about mm -hmm. it, you're already bombarded with so much information. I mean, I was planning my son's funeral and I'd never even been a part of any funeral. Yeah. And I didn't even know they were asking me all these questions. And I'm thinking, I don't know what they're even talking about. Like, you know, I, I had to step back and say, okay, wait, what are the choices of what you're talking about? Like what, because I don't know what the answers are. And I think if you had that already available to someone and then they had something that they suffered grief, I think, I don't know how many like millions of people, are on their thing, but I'm just giving a shout out in case anybody like wants to tell him. Yes. Because that is a very, um, man, that is, that is a brilliant, brilliant idea. idea. Yeah, it's a brilliant <laughs> idea. Yes. And it's something that would need to be, you know, led by someone who actually understands the process. It's not something you're just going to make up on the spot. Um, you have to understand grief, but wow, I am with you. That yeah. would be amazing. So if anybody sees Carl, um, could you let him know that we're to talk to Dr. Robin? Like, we need to <laughs> talk to Dr. Robin yes. Donaldson. I'd be happy to create a yoga for grief uh, video or you know for on demand because you're right. I would go to yoga classes, and even though, like, I would have to ignore half of what they were saying. I know it was inspirational, but it was things like you know just let it go and like. You know, um, I, I thought some not so nice words to say back to them, but like, no, I'm, I'm not going to let go of my grief or my husband or, you know, yeah. so, so there, there's, there's a nuance there to folks that understand the grieving process as it relates to yoga um, and different postures and what is very helpful. And if you believe in a lot of the, the chakra discussion and the energy flow, that can be, that can be a piece in there as well. Um, my thought is that I know that my body always feels so much better when I've gone through like a full body stretchful yoga piece and I'm better able to deal with the stress of the day. We'll just put it that way, regardless of what it is, grief or. Yeah, it's just stress. Right. Yeah. It's Yes, but I think the idea for someone who's grieving and I love this idea. I, I, yeah, I think that that's a pretty powerful thing. Um, you walking through you, you know, what you walk through gives you insight into places that we wouldn't have any idea. I, you know, I always talk about being broken open. My capacity changed. Sure. The capacity for doing this conference. 
I, I would have I would not have even been interested. You know, I, I had a whole different um, path for my life, I think. And this just opened up a lot of things to be able to come together with awesome people like you. And, you know, just the fact that you have those kind of um, ideas, they that didn't come from you having a PT life. Right. You know, that, that came from a broken place. But when you were broken open from that, look what comes out of it. Oh yeah, believe me. Before, before Michael died, I, you know, I had planned. I was going to go to grad school. You know, I was going to finish that. I was going to go into private practice. I was going to get married. Like everything was set out, and then you get that turned on its head, and you say, "Oh, okay. Well, I don't get to plan." And nothing makes sense and it feels so chaotic and then you start to realize look at what all is available to me because I'm no longer ascribing to that you know just one foot in front of the other type of a life that felt so safe but there is no safety in that there's no safety in any of it so you might as well do something that just gets you passionate and makes you want to wake up in the morning to go do it. I love yes. that. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good. I, my goodness, we could talk to you all day. <laughs> I, I am just in awe. I hope that we will be able to like work together on some more things in the future because I'm telling you, you are amazing. And thank you for not just laying down. Oh, like, of course. Because this is also a lot of work. I mean, yeah. what you're talking about is a lot of work. But it's a blessing. What a blessing. Oh, it's a blessing. I am, you just get me excited. I know. Do you want to say, stuff. since we like can't keep our mouths closed, <laughs> we are just like so excited. You're our new princess friend. And like, oh, I'm an honorary <laughs> princess. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I have an extra pound to share. <laughs> I'm good with that. I'm good. As long as there's no litter to go around. <laughs> do you have anything that you want to like like say as we close we we are running out of time but do you have anything in particular you want to say to the ones that are watching um i think that the just the biggest thing with grief is giving yourself permission to grieve whatever that looks like um and, and don't um judging is super easy right understanding is a lot harder and and judgments come up self judgments other people are going to judge you if i'm grief um but but listen to your gut listen to you because this is your journey nobody else has the same grief journey that you do uh, and, and definitely hold on to that and take care of you because a lot of times you, you feel like you can push grief away oh no 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 that's fine i need to focus on the job or i need to focus on the kids or i need to focus on this or that and it's like well, no if you don't take care of the grief first none of that is going to be taken care of so you really got to go into you to you first so um but i am i'm extremely thrilled that i got to be on the show i'm sorry the the conference not the show the conference <laughs> and and definitely i i would love to to chat with the, the both of you more in the future about different ideas and um and just to connect let's definitely keep connecting and staying in touch Plus, you're a whole lot of fun. I just want to say that. <laughs> and you know, if, if you live in in Vegas, I I am in Vegas what four, probably four times a year, and yeah. so I'm thinking I know exactly where we can meet up at. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much. You are welcome. Thank you all for having me. My pleasure. Well, this is Kim White with the My Sexy Business team. And Christy Bridges from One Moment Wiser. <laughs> we are so grateful that you joined the Hope to Hope conference. And we hope that you will come back. Our next session is at 4.30 Central, 5.30 Eastern, and 2.30 Vegas time. time. <laughs> yes. This <laughs> 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 is the math. <laughs> So thank you guys for being here. Love you.